Thanks so much. And thanks for um, inviting me to speak. Um, it's really nice to have an opportunity to um, share what um, us physios get up to um, in clinics, because um, I think certainly there's there's lots of people who have a really good um, understanding of, um, of what we do. But equally, um, I'm aware that sometimes um, people who may, maybe don't work quite so closely with physios um, may just um, see this, I guess, um, black box of that we do chest physio twice a day. And I'm hoping just to provide a little bit of um, clarity to what that might involve. Um, so, Today, um, I'm going to talk you through um, some of the common um, airway clearance techniques that we use. So um, introducing them and talk about some of the underpinning um, physiology behind them um, and look at really what we can learn from um, research that's being done in patients with cystic fibrosis and look at some of the challenges that we face um, trying to collect data um, about airway clearance techniques. So airway clearance techniques um, aim to facilitate clearance of mucus from the airways and they are really commonly used where either um, the body's natural ability to clear the mucus is impaired or where there's um, sort of an, an, an abnormal load of secretions. Um, so these kind of two, two key points. And in terms of in PCD, we know that PCD causes impaired mucosillary clearance and without effective airway clearance, we move around this vicious cycle of um, inflammatory tissue damage. So the retained mucus makes us more likely to pick up bacterial infections. That in process um, leads to um, a neutrophilic inflammatory process and tissue damage, which then further damages um, the cilia and impairs mucosillary clearance further. So where airway clearance um, techniques come in is that they try to um, minimise that retention of mucus. So to um, almost break this cycle or reduce um, the, you know, the severity of this cycle um, and try and prevent um, the damage happening. So there's lots of different airway clearance techniques that are available and there's some pictures of things that you will see here. And um, I think sometimes it can be um, interesting to look at why, you know, some um, physiotherapists use lots of different techniques for different individuals. And I'm hoping to kind of demystify that a little bit for you today. And what I really want to just, um, you know, start out with is by saying that we're aware that the patient group that we work with are really diverse and um, they have lots of different physical needs and also lots of different kind of, um, you know, psychosocial needs. So lots of different lifestyles and preferences. And for me, that's really the driving force behind um, wanting to tailor um, the techniques for different individuals, because, you know, I certainly believe as we go through this, you'll see that I believe that one size doesn't fit all. And this is um, quite a complicated side, and I'm aware we've got some people who um, aren't sciencey on the call. So, um, just to kind, of, I'll try and simplify things as best as we can. But essentially, what we're going to look at today is that, as part of airway clearance, what we are essentially doing is manipulating air to help use air to push the secretions up and out of the lungs, and. When we have um, diseases, it can affect um, different parts of um, the body's process of, of getting rid of getting the ability to get rid of secretions. So it can um, having having different conditions can affect the resistance of the airways. So um, your airways may be more narrow, or they might have secretions that are blocking them. That can make it um, more difficult for the air to leave the lungs. Um, the, the stability of the walls of the bronchioles can be can be changed so they can become a little bit more floppy and um, easier to kind of compress. Um, things like the work of breathing can be changed so you, it might be harder to breathe or you might move, use slightly different muscles to breathe and again that can affect your airway clearance. So we're going to look at a few of these in a little bit more depth to, to understand what we're thinking about when we are um, choosing regimes for different people. So this is, a, I guess, um, quite a key slide that we're going to come back to the principles of this as we move through today's session. So when we're thinking about airway clearance, we're really breaking it down into four steps. And what I really want to highlight today is how important this initial step one is of opening up. So often, um, you know, we have mucus throughout our airways, but the place where it tends to get 
um, stuck or be problematic at, um, the, the most or first is in the much smaller um, really peripheral airways because they're, they're smaller, they're more um, prone to the sputum getting stuck down there and they also don't necessarily have cartilage down there so they're a little bit more floppy and more prone to collapse and it's really important with an airway clearance that we focus on um, this initial step of getting the air down behind the secretions so that then we can then use that air to kind of push the secretions out a little bit so in this four step plan you'll see me coming back to you throughout these slides so step one is opening up getting the air down behind the mucus then we need to loosen the secretions from the smaller airways mobilize them up um, so that they're coming up into the larger airways where they then can be evacuated from the big airways so with something like a, a huff or a cough um, from those large airways and a lot of the um, physiological techniques uh, or underlying principles that I'm talking about today are summarised really eloquently in this article um, written by Maggie McElwain. So I um, just want to kind of direct you to that if, um, if you're a keto and you want to look for some sort of further reading in this area. So one of the principles that is um, discussed within sort of physiology of airway clearance is about collateral ventilation. So within our little lung units, so there's, there's millions of these little lung units within your lungs, um, they we kind of have little neighbors so where we have neighbors we actually have little communications so channels and pores that allow um, air to flow from one lung unit into the lung unit next door so these um, when your lungs are healthy, they, they're, they're just there, but they're not often used because actually to get through these airways, the, the, the airway resistance is quite high. Um, so normally air doesn't move through these, but actually when we have um, abnormal abnormalities within our lungs, if you have um, sputum that is blocking one of the airways, then if you've got one airway that is you know, working much better, we see a change in pressure between these two. So you can often get air trapped within um, the, the kind of the obstructed um, lung unit. And that means that then we get a change in pressure and actually we can utilize this to get air down behind where the blockage is and help to push the mucus out. So this is a principle which, is, um, which underlies some of the, the physiotherapy techniques that we, um, that we think of. And this is really about opening up the, the lung units at that start of that important process of airway clearance. Similarly, um, employing um, the help of neighbours and um, looking at pendulum interdependence. So this is thinking about that some, um, some of the lung units will open up and, and work much more readily than others. Um, so I guess an easy way to think about this is if you've had a balloon that you've already blown up once before compared to one that's brand new and is really stiff. So the one that's been blown up before is much quicker and much easier to inflate that. So similarly within our lungs, even though they've all been used before, you'll have some airways that are much more ready to, to open up and, and to expand. And some that will be a little bit more resistive and will have high resistance. They will be slower to open up. And when we look at this in terms of um, the sort of neighboring lung units. So if you have a little area that is a little bit stiffer and takes a little bit longer to open up, the benefit is that there is, um, kind of a, a tension between um, these different neighbours. So actually, if you manage to open up the neighbours, that that tension will help to, to open up the area that is a little bit more reluctant to open. So again, it's great. It really helps us to, to kind of open up our airways. And we need to think about this again when we're doing our airway clearance techniques. And this slide just explains how there can be sort of a time lag between when you when your muscles go to um, kind of to expand your chest and, and take, help you take a deep breath in. There can be a little bit of a time lag before the air kind of then um, really gets down into those lower airways. And this can be more accentuated when you have um, more changes within your airways um, and yeah, and more abnormalities. So it can take a little bit longer for um, for some areas of your lungs to open. And this slide looks at the equal pressure point. I did mean to, to, to not flick on all of this side all at once so that it's uh, not too much to look at. But if you just focus on the, the blue tree on the left hand side to start with. So our, our lungs have lots of different divisions as they go down. And the, the upper airways are a little bit more sturdy because they've got cartilage that are helping to um, keep them nice and, and sturdy and keep them really patent and open. And as you move down to sort of the bronchial level and getting down into our smaller airways, actually those airways don't have cartilage in them. So they are a little bit more prone to, to collapsing down. Um, 
So if we look across at the right hand image, this is looking at um, something called the equal pressure point. So just to kind of de-science this a little bit, what this basically means is that um, where the pressure outside the lungs, um, so the pleural pressure, where it is the same as the pressure in the airways, you get something called the equal pressure point. So those pressures are equal, okay? Now, as up at sort of the, the mouth area, um, the pressure within your airways is zero, so it's the same as the as the air around you. And then as you get further down into the lungs, the airway pressure increases. OK, so what we're thinking about here is how hard um, we are contracting the muscles and the pressures that we're applying when we're when we're trying to clear our airways. So if you think about something like a cough, so a cough will is a really big pressure. So it creates a big pressure outside of the lungs. So where the equal pressure point is, where that pressure outside is the same as inside, ends up being really kind of further down in the lungs into the smaller airways. And what that means is that the airways are more prone to collapse. So if you when you do a big a big hard cough you will get some temporary um kind of closing of these small airways and that's okay because then you take a big breath in and, and they can open back up again but actually if your blob of sputum is stuck on the wrong side of where that airway closure is if, if your blob of sputum is further down the airways then that means that you've got that closure with your sputum almost on the wrong side of the door um so uh, some of these techniques really focus on um, controlling the pressures that um that we are using when we, we're trying to kind of evacuate the secretions um, and timing um, the huffs and coughs for, for when the secretions are far enough up the airway so that they can come out effectively. And I always have in the back of my mind when I'm thinking about this, almost um, squeezing a tube of toothpaste. So when you've got that last bit of toothpaste that you're wanting to get out, you have to carefully move it up the tube before it's ready to come out. So yeah, random analogy that I have in the back of my mind when I'm thinking about this technique. And thinking about um, the speed that the air can come out of our lungs. So obviously, um, if we are using air to kind of push the mucus up out of the lungs, if that air can move out nice and fast, if there's lots of air able to pass out, then it's going to have a better ability to push the mucus out of the lungs. So if you do have um, any kind of bronchospasm, so any kind of wheeze, any tightening of your airways, then it's important to try and minimise that either through, um, you know, sort of blue inhalers if it's there, or if, you know, if it is um, that you're pushing really hard with your physiotherapy, then um, that can, you know, really can be counterproductive and can reduce the ability of the air to push the mucus out. So it's important that we think about um, really being able to move the air out of the lungs nice and, and quickly by making sure they're nice and open. And this um, is a slide which um, summarises um, flows. So this is all about looking at um, the different speeds. So the peak expiratory flow is the speed that the air comes out of your lungs at its fastest point. Um, and the peak inspiratory flow is the, the fastest that the, the air goes into your lungs. And, th and this, um, this paper looked at comparing sort of the, the speed um, that you breathe in and the speed that you breathe out. So if we're trying to move mucus up those airways, we want the speed um, that we're breathing out to be the fastest so that instead of pushing the sputum back down, actually the air airflow is pushing the secretions up and out. Um, so for things like huffs and coughs, they are really biased towards um, expiration to the breath out, so that's fantastic. Um, but some of the techniques that we commonly use, as you can see here, um, percussion, acapella, pep, they don't quite achieve that. So actually, because we are slowing down sometimes the, the breath out, um, sometimes that can um, affect how efficient the airway clearance technique may be. So we need to think about building in these strategies together to get the benefits of, of the different components of the regimes. So just to talk about some commonly used um, techniques. So active cycle breathing technique is, as it says on the tin, a breathing technique. And some people use this just as a, an element all by itself. But actually, as physiotherapists, we quite often build this into people's um, physiotherapy regimes, so different components of it. So this involves um, breathing control, so relaxed breathing using the diaphragm, um, trying to um, get really relaxed ventilation to open up the airways. 
thoracic expansion exercises. So nice big deep breaths in. And within that, what we're trying to do is really open up the airways. It's good to have um, a, an inspiratory pause in there. So to um, not just breathe straight back out, to hold your breath just for a moment at the top. And again, if we think back to those principles we were talking about earlier, that's um, you know really trying to open up those little areas of lung unit, giving chance for the, you know, for the air and the pressure to kind of assist with that um, getting the air down behind the secretions. Once we've got everything nice and open, we do some huffs, so some forced expiratory techniques. Um, I'm sure most people are familiar with these, but if you're not, it's a little bit like you're steaming up a mirror. So you have an open glottis and you do a, a kind of a push out with the air. And that ensures that we're getting that nice, fast breath out to mobilize the secretions up the airway so that when we're ready, we can then cough or huff those out. And you move around this cycle as needed. So once the secretions are up and ready, you then huff and cough them out. Autogenic drainage also um, kind of targets all of the all of the elements of the airway clearance regime. So this works on the principle, sorry, a little bit of a complicated slide, um, but this works on the principle that the normal sized breaths that we take, so this little small red squiggly line, actually, that's only a small part of what we are able to take. So if you were to fill your lungs all the way to the top and then blow out as long as you possibly can, actually, that's a much bigger range and a much bigger volume. And we can play about with where we take our size of breath to be able to loosen the secretions. So within autogenic drainage, there is some controlled breathing um, to try and you know, ensure that we are um, really opening up the airways as needed. Um, we're talking about loosening the secretions. So we talk about um, breathing at the level where we can start to feel the secretions loosening, um, mobilizing it by moving from um, moving up the airways so we become um, more full as we move through these cycles and then evacuating so coughing or huffing the sputum out right when it's at the top when it's in those big airways and is ready to come out so again this addresses all of those components and again some people do this as a standalone technique some people use components of this within their airway clearance regimes Manual techniques, I think, are, um, I guess, what people think of sometimes when they think of physiotherapy, certainly from kind of um, slightly older times. Um, and these are, so patting, percussion. Um, so the picture on the left shows you a lady with um, cupped hands um, percussing over the rib cage. And the idea of that is to um, cause some um, airway turbulence to dislodge the secretions from the, the, the airway walls and um, to, again, allow it to kind of come up. And the picture on the right shows you expiratory vibrations. So here the therapist is placing her hands on the patient's chest wall. And the idea behind this is that as the patient breathes out, the, the, the therapist applies um, a compressive and um, vibra sort of, um, vibrating force to the chest wall. And again, that's to increase the airway turbulence to you know, help assist moving the secretions off the, the the airway walls, but also to increase the speed of that breath out to, to really push the air out of the lungs and mobilise the secretions of the airways. So you'll notice in here at the top hand corner, I've put that, you know, we, these techniques should loosen and mobilise secretions, but actually these can be done pretty passively. You know, the, the, the person receiving them can just lie there and not take part. But if they don't take part, we sometimes struggle the elements of opening up. Um, and obviously they need to also kind of cough as and when they're ready. So these, you know, to, for these to work as, as best as they possibly can, we need to be thinking about um, the person who is receiving the technique, um, taking some deeper breaths, um, maybe doing some breath holds within there to really try and ensure that we are opening up the airways within this um, element of the re 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 regime. Sorry, I'm getting tongue tied. So positioning, um, what we've got here are some pictures of what is traditionally thought of as um, postural drainage. And it used to be that um, people used to do these kind of head down tip positions lying in lots of different positions. The theory behind this was that we could kind of tip the secretions out of the airways by lying in different positions. And certainly, you know, more recently with, you know, practice has moved away from this concept because we know that actually um, secretions don't really move particularly well and they would have a long way to travel if we were just tipping them out like uh, in this manner. So whilst we do still use positioning, it's very much changed. 
you know, a lot of people now avoid the head down tip positions um, because of the concerns that it may um, cause reflux, um, especially for people that do lots of coughing. Um, so we can use these modified positions where actually we're, we're getting the position change, but the theory behind this isn't to tip the secretions out of the lungs. Actually, it's about changing um, which area of, of the lungs is, is opening up. So when you're you know, rest, at rest, you don't use all of your lungs all of the time. Actually, you will um, preferentially use um, a different area of lung depending on what position you are in. And this varies between adults and children and how sort of compliant your chest wall is. So by moving through the different positions, you are allowing different areas of lung to open up um, so that it, it, the secretions can be cleared from that area um, well. And also, um, you know, I guess as you're getting up and down and moving between all of these different positions, there are gonna be some sort of shearing forces within your chest that hopefully will dislodge some secretions as well. So this is, um, this is PEP and, and this is showing you a PEP mask, but some people have this via um, like a slightly different manufacturer with a, a mouthpiece or there is a mouthpiece that attaches to this as well. The principle is kind of the same. Um, so here um, you can see um, this um, girl is blowing out into her mask and there's a little pressure gauge and the picture below that shows you the mask and the different coloured valves. So this is a one way valve system. So as you breathe in, um, it's nice and easy. There's a big there's a big space, a big hole for you to breathe in through. And then as you breathe out, you breathe out through one of these colored small resistors. So these make the, the diameter um, that you're breathing out of smaller. So it's essentially like blowing out through a straw in a bit more of a technical manner, however. Um, and what that does, it creates, it slows down your respiratory flow and it creates a little bit of pressure back within your airways. So if you look at the kind of the, the, the kind of the knobbly picture with the arrows on at the top right, um, when you are um, sort of huffing and coughing and trying to clear your chest, as we described, you can get this kind of this compressive force on the airways. What PEP does is it helps to increase um, the pressure within your lower airways. So this is really good if you do have some obstructed lung units or if you know if you have uh, little pockets where the air has got a little bit stuck within your lungs. Um, by opening them up, it just allows the air to pass more freely in and out of those sections, um, allowing things to kind of become a little bit more normal, hopefully removing any blockages. And this is the principle on which, um, so when we think back to those channels of collateral ventilation, the, you know, getting in through your neighbor's door almost. And um, that's what this is really employing. It's allowing um, air to kind of pass between the lung, lung units a little bit more easily. So again, this is, this is fantastic in terms of opening up and loosening the mucus. But as we talked about with that slide of, of making sure that the, the breath out is enough, actually this, this will open up and loosen, but you still need to mobilize the secretions at the airway. So we still need to add in something like a huff to then get that faster airflow out of the lungs and, um, and to move the mucus up into the larger airway. So we've got to ensure that we're getting all of the components of the regime in there to be as effective as possible. Oscillatory PEP um, kind of adds on to that concept of PEP. So here you do have that similar kind of opening of the airways and um, sometimes to a lesser extent, lesser pressures. But on top of that, you have um, an oscillatory pressure. So for those of you that are familiar with some of these devices, they make kind of a bit of a purring noise as the air and the pressures and the air vibrate within within the airways. So there's a few different um, a few different pieces of equipment and they all perform slightly differently. Um, so, um, for instance, the, the aerobica, um, it makes you, you kind of have to push all the way through your breath out with the aerobica and, the, and the, the oscillations, the wobble happens all the way through. Whereas with things like the acapella, it doesn't happen right at the start. And sometimes at the end, it doesn't happen at, at lower flows. But, you know, these are, you know, these have different pros and cons depending on who you are as an individual, what your ability is um, so it really is about kind of matching the the, the device to the person um, again here I've put that they you know they do open up they, there is that opening of the lungs they certainly will aim to loosen the mucus because there's there's all of that shearing force trying to dislodge the mucus from the airways 
But again, we need to think about if we are definitely getting achieving those airflows to mobilize um, mobilize the secretions up the up the tree, up into those bigger airways, because some of these devices may not do that. So again, you, you need to be, you know, think about thinking about that and building in components of the regime to make sure that that part of it is happening. So similarly, um, a couple more strategies here that are oscillatory PEP. So bubble PEP, um, where the tube goes under the water um, to make bubbles, um, will open up the airways and again, provide that oscillatory, oscillatory component. And the corn, it can work very similarly, or it can actually work a little bit differently. So it can be set a little bit differently where we get less of a stable pressure opening the airways, so less PEP but a much more chaotic waveform, so much more of a shearing of the mucus off the walls of, of the lungs as well. The vest is something that we don't often use um, with people with PCD in the UK. We do have some individuals who do use it who, um, for, you know, for, for very sort of specific reasons. Um, and but I'm aware of it is used um, much more commonly in some countries, especially sort of in the US. Um, and I think the, the challenge with this is so how this works is um, you pop this little vest on, it attaches by some hoses to this machine here. The, the machine blows air into this jacket, which um, provides a bit of compression, so a bit of a squash to the chest wall, and then it pulsates. So it kind of shakes the external of the chest wall, which in theory sh shakes the way it does. It shakes the air inside the lungs, dislodging the secretions from the chest wall. So it will loosen the secretions and it, it you know, because of that compressive force, it, it should you know, mobilise the secretions of the airway. But I think um, some of the concerns with you know, how this device may be used is actually it is, can be a very convenient device. And if you are distracted doing other things whilst it is on, it, you know, it, it does squash your airways a little bit. And actually, if you're not taking nice big breaths while this is on, it probably won't be quite as effective. It can be combined with other things such as, um, you know, doing some deep breathing, using a pet mask again to build in those components of opening up. But we've got to bear in mind that, you know, it, it doesn't quite cover all elements of of the, you know, of the airway clearance cycle. And they're quite expensive. But, you know, for some people, they are fantastic. Certainly, I've got um, a couple of young people that I've started this on who are really struggle for, for a variety of reasons to engage with other forms of physiotherapy. And this is something that which isn't very commonly used in PCD. This is, um, there are a few different brands. Clearway is probably the most commonly used in the UK at the moment. And these are called mechanical insufflator exsufflators. So these basically aim to give you a positive pressure. So it blows at you as you breathe in, which helps you to get a bigger, deeper breath and open those airways. And then it kind of uh, creates a bit of a sucking and negative pressure as you um, as you then go to cough um, to help to increase your expiratory flow. So these are used a lot for people who have a reduced cough strength. So commonly in neuromuscular conditions. And because most of the time um, people with PCD still have a really strong, effective cough, we don't see it used very commonly in PCD, but occasionally we do. So within all of this, it's also different medications that can be used to facilitate airway clearance so the muco active so things like um, saline and hypotonic saline mucolytics so dnas which is commonly used in cystic fibrosis but less in bronchiectasis and pcd um, and bronchodilators so things to open up the airways and they're really important to ensure that we we get them timed well and timed right within the regime Things, um, especially sort of the mucoactive, so especially sort of the, the saline and hypotonic saline can be combined with some of these devices. So they can be combined with some of the, the PEP and the oscillatory PEP adjuncts and, and certainly can be very effectively combined with breathing techniques as well. And the reason for that sometimes is because it can help to reduce the treatment burden and help people who are struggling um, to do all of their treatment regimes. So sometimes we find people um, will manage one of the element of their treatment regime really well and struggle with other parts and actually streamlining things can help some people. There are some, um, I guess, two schools of thought about the how the, then the drug is, is delivered to the lungs. Some people think it might not be delivered as effectively. Some people think that um, actually because you are helping the airways to open well, you might get um, a better delivery to the, of the drug to the smaller airways. So I think it really is about trying this on an individual basis to see what works well for somebody. It does require a little bit more coordination as well um, to make sure you're, you know, you're doing all the components of the regime right when you're doing them all at the same time. 
And it's important that the nebulizer is positioned well, so um, to be positioned appropriately within the circuit so that you don't get unnecessary losses of the, the drug within the device. So within all of this, we, you know, as physios, you know, we're, we're not just looking at somebody as a pair of lungs, um, you know, there also is a nose attached, which as physios, we can be quite excited about and um, trying to help people with managing their upper airway. Um, but again, that might influence our, our choice of treatment regime. So, you know, for some people, we may specifically choose a PET mask um, because it will also provide some pressure and some splinting open into the upper airways, um, just as, a, as an example. We think about exercise and how active somebody is because we know about the benefits of, of, of exercise as well. And we'll talk about exercise and airway clearance in just a moment. Um, that isn't somebody running from the toilet. <laughs> this is thinking about continence. So we know that sometimes if you huff and cough a lot, it can make you feel a little bit worried that you may be incontinent and it can put additional stress on, um, on the muscles um, of your pelvic floor. So again, this is something that we look out for as physiotherapists to try and help minimize the impact of that for our patients. Um, the rest of the body. So uh, we've got a pair of lungs, but actually there's the rest of the kind of the body um, attached to it. And um, if your rib cage, for example, isn't moving very well, or if you've got a bit of a stiff back, or if you've got a bit of a hunched posture, that can really affect how well your, your, you know, your lungs can open up, or if you've got pain, it can affect your ability to do your airway clearance. So we certainly look at the, the rest of the, of the body with it. And then, of course, it's it's not just a body, it's it's a person actually with, you know, with a lifestyle and and physiotherapy is is just one element of people's worlds. And whilst we hope people, you know, find that doing physiotherapy effectively will you know, manage their symptoms and allow them to do what they want. You know, it's it's still a burden. It's still an extra thing to do every day forever. And we're really aware of that. And, you know, I think as physiotherapists, we try to um, ensure that we are um, finding the regime that works for that person because everybody's needs are different, everybody's preferences are different. Um, and this really, um, I think is probably one of the most significant parts of choosing what regime is right for somebody. So just to touch on exercise, because that's, I guess, a whole topic in itself as well. You know, in terms of, of exercise, it does increase ventilation. Um, so if you are exercising um, at an effective level, you will be taking bigger breaths. That is bound to recruit um, some of those airways that are normally closed when you're sitting down and relaxing. Um, and it will improve your peak expiratory flow rate. So it will improve um, the speed that the air is coming out of your lungs because you are having to breathe faster when you are when you are challenging yourself. Um, but um, because you're also breathing in fast, um, it doesn't necessarily um, give us that airflow bias towards breathing out that we need. So it is important to include um, huffs um, at, at least within your airway clearance regime if you're using exercise for that. And I think things now have moved towards these treatment donuts and, and credit to Louisa Hill at, at GOSH for, for you know, kind of drawing this concept together. Um, so actually, everybody's um, treatment regime is very individual to them, and it might be made up of different components. So airway clearance, exercise, nebulizers, and upper area management for this individual. And the balance of what is right for somebody is different between people. And it will also be different um, at different stages of their life and different when they're poorly. Um, so it really is very much, I believe, about this individualized approach to finding what is right for somebody. So I hope this has kind of helped you see that there are lots of different techniques out there. And I think it's really easy for us to record down what treatment technique somebody is doing, but actually it matters how they are using it because it's okay having, you know, an acapella or a pet mask, but actually if you're not, you know, ensuring that you're doing all of the components of the regime, then it's not going to work as well as it possibly could. So I think this is where we hit a bit of a challenge in that, um, you know, does standardising airway clearance techniques for research studies make sense? Because I think, you know, within research, there very much is this appeal of, of making everything standardised so that we can really see what the true effect of something is. But actually, that doesn't really fit with how we are working predominantly in practice, where we are tailoring things more for individuals. So I think it's useful to look at what we can learn from cystic fibrosis. And before we do that, I think it's important to recognise similarities and differences between PCB and CF. So 
yes, both um, both conditions have impaired mucus clearance for different reasons. And the age of diagnosis can be different. So we know that cystic fibrosis is commonly diagnosed much younger than, than PCD. And I think that that can change um, sort of how, how symptoms feel and how symptoms are and how the burden of doing physiotherapy can feel sometimes. Um, so, you know, with, uh, with people with PCD, you know, the symptoms can very much come on, you know, from birth. So it can be difficult to know when we're having exacerbations, when things are different, and there generally always is some secretions there somewhere, even if they are hiding a little bit. We do see that with um, with PCD that the you know we tend to see the distal airway, so the small airway di disease is really happening um, first. Um, we see that the bronchiectasis um, occurs more commonly in PCD in in sort of the mid to lower airways uh, lobes of the lungs, sorry, um, can, which contrasts with CF, which predominantly sees it in the upper lobes of the lungs. And whilst, you know, CF has that underlying reason why the mucus is thicker and stickier, actually there are some similarities in the mucus properties. And, um, you know, we can certainly see some very tenacious secretions um, with people with PCD. And if we look at these kind of studies of what's been done in, in CF and bronchiectasis, there's, there's an awful, you know, there's an awful lot of research that has been done in this area. So I'm just going to kind of talk you through this. So there's been studies that have looked at um, airway clearance versus no airway clearance um, in CF and bronchiectasis. And what they've shown us is that we do see short term improvements in the mucus clearance, um, that they are safe. Um, and that it can sort of help with um, lung hyperinflation, um, it can help with symptoms and it can improve quality of life. There's been five Cochrane reviews of head to head comparisons. So Cochrane reviews are, you know, looking at, um, you know, all of these different, um, you know, lots and lots of different studies and, and trying to pull all of that evidence together. You know, so we've seen, you know, conventional chest physio, so patting and shakes compared to every other adjunct autogenic drainage compared to every other intervention, PEP, um, active cycle, o oscillatory PEP. So, you know, these really have been explored in great depth. But when you add all of these studies together, they really show that no one airway clearance technique is superior over a six month period in terms of lung function, quality of life and breathlessness. Um, so, you know, we really kind of have exhausted looking at, you know, is this adjunct best versus this adjunct best within CF and bronchiectasis. Um, and when we look at, you know, can exercise replace airway clearance, the jury's still out. It's inconclusive. We don't know at the moment. And I think this is a really um, interesting um, editorial, to, which, um, yeah, again, if you're interested in this, to go and have a little look at it. And it looks at why actually this is a really difficult area to do research in. Um, and to summarise, you know, there's a really big range of different treatment interventions um, and, you know, there's difficulty blinding. You know, it's very difficult to, to you know, hide from somebody whether they're doing an acapella or a breathing technique because you need that person to participate in what they're doing and there's lack of sort of protocol data so there's a lack of sort of standardizing the way that we do these things and in my opinion that's for good reasons because actually we have personalized regimes for people you know some people need very set re regimes of you know you do this many breaths in this position and some people um are more able to um tell how much you know how much physiotherapy they need to do in a certain way before they change what they're doing so it's I think it's it's good to have that versatility there's also challenges in in terms of well how do we know something's being effective you know you can look at how much sputum somebody coughs out but actually you know does that really accurately tell you if they're swallowing some of it as well um you know, lung function can be really flawed um, quality of life is you know is certainly emerging um but you know i guess that's a bit more of a longer term measure you know you can't really just get somebody to do their chest video and then immediately ask them if their quality of life has changed afterwards because it doesn't really work like that some studies have looked at um clearing sort of radioactive traces from the lungs looking at hospital admissions and ivs and exacerbations preference and exercise tolerance and these all have the different merits and challenges and certainly in longer term studies it's quite difficult to know know um, how much physiotherapy somebody is doing at home to really understand um, what the you know what the impact of it is 
And I think what I want to kind of really hark back to is this fact that I think, you know, we are all unique and, and everybody who does airway clearance or who needs to do airway clearance is unique and they have really unique needs. And actually, you know, I think it's really important for people to have this kind of toolkit approach. So to have lots of different things that they can use and for them to be able to kind of, you know, adapt their regimes and, and, and bring in different components as they need so that we are ensuring that we're getting all of those four different components of airway clearance to make sure it's effective so it's not just about doing an acapella actually it is about you know employing all of the different strategies around it be it positioning be it um you know doing some active cycle with it um doing your nebulizers with it it's these regimes are complex and um, to allow us to make the most of all the different um, bits of the, the regime components to really optimize, pick the best bits from them all to get the right mixture, the right recipe for the individual at that point in time. So recording regimes then becomes really difficult. So it's really, it's okay for, you know, for us from a physio point of view to, you know, in terms of clinics and things, because we can, you know, write down and describe exactly what's done. But when we're trying to then put things into boxes to kind of collect data becomes really difficult um, so you know this is um, a piece of work that I was involved with um, so and you know I'm, I'm not kind of criticizing this I'm just saying it's, it's really difficult so we can write down what type um, of interventions people are doing how often they're doing it um, what their compliance is um, but actually it's really difficult to kind of capture those um those more gray parts of the regime so actually how well is somebody managing to to do those really quality breaths what positions is somebody doing them in and do they do them every day or just when they feel the need to and how much do they do and is that enough it's it's really really difficult and i don't have the answers to how we start you know doing data collection on this because i think it is so complex trying to capture this information and it will be really useful to see going forward if there is a way that we can collect this data because obviously collecting big data helps us it helps us to understand what is working but it's it's really tricky in this area and in terms of recording regimes as we've described you know it's often the frequency and the device that is used but actually, I think that's only looking at certain pieces of the puzzle. And there is so much here that we can see, but there's so much more that if we move the magnifying glass, we see other parts of what's going on for people. Adherence is this really key element. So it's great knowing what physio regime you have, but actually it's about if you are managing to do that regime and if it is working for you and collecting data on that is really tricky. So, you know, it's it's a little bit easier for drug studies because we, you know, you can chip things and you can you can know how often people are taking them or we can, you know, try and better estimate how often they're doing their regimes. But actually with this, it's it's really difficult to get that kind of quality information about, you know, is you know, is the quality of the regime. So it's okay if if somebody's doing it, yes, no, but it's not just a yes, no exercise. It's about how well is it working for that person. And that's really challenging to kind of collect that information. So just to summarise, you know, there's lots of different components to airway clearance regimes. And I think, you know, physiotherapy re reviews are really essential to um, reviewing the suitability of a regime for somebody, but also the quality of that regime. So, you know, when we do see patients in clinic, I think quite often we do tweak things and, and change regimes a little bit. And that's absolutely not coming from a place of being critical. It's coming from a place of really refining what that individual is doing and trying to make sure that the time that they invest in doing airway clearance, you know, it's boring, it's time consuming, it's it's rubbish at having to do this stuff. It reminds them that they are unwell, you know we want to make sure that whatever they're doing can work as best as it can for them so you know that's why we are constantly kind of making suggestions and making little tweaks here and there just to keep making it you know as good as it can be for that individual it's really difficult to collect data in this area um you know it's it's easy from you know a clinical point of view but actually when you start trying to audit it it's really difficult trying to get um really relevant meaningful data um and certainly for research i think this is a challenge that um we haven't yet got the answer to the questions um here but i think it's really important to make research clinically relevant so yeah standardizing things 
helps in some ways but actually the more we standardize things the more we move away from the practice where we are individualizing things for patients and you know it then makes it harder to translate the research to our practice if it's a long way away from from actually what we're doing so thank you for um for your attention um I hope I've made that kind of accessible and, and given you enough detail, but I am I'm very happy to take any questions and have a, um, yeah, a bit of a further discussion about this. Um, so I will stop sharing and then hopefully I can see you all. Thanks, Lynn. That was an absolutely brilliant talk and it was just super clear and you made that really accessible. Um, so we're going to kick off the, the Q&A session with a question from Lucy Dixon. In terms of efficiencies and streamlining the techniques, e.g. nebulizing and aerobica ETC uh, at the same time, what's the rationale for deciding which is the best technique to use? Are you basing it on anecdote, for example, if the person with PCD feels it's better, or via evidence, so volume of sputum produced or lung function? So I think there is no um, one. I think the, the message of today is one size does not fit all. So um, I think the measures that we have in clinical practice can be really variable. So um, it's really difficult to track things like volume of sputum cleared um, in the sense that, you know, is it the physiotherapy regime that we've changed? Is it, um, you know, something else? Is the person less hydrated? Is it that, the you know, their disease has changed? It's really difficult to kind of single out what might be making a difference. And I think I think you've got, you've got a really stark difference. So I think if somebody, you know, coughs lots up and suddenly says, actually, that was loads easier to do my physio, that gives you a very transparent, you know, sign. Um, or if somebody's been really struggling to do their regime and actually, you know, they only have time to do the nebulizer. Um, so then they don't bother doing their aerobic because they've used all their time for their, you know, their nebulizer. It's like, well, actually, if we do both together, you are getting both components of that regime. So maybe that is right. So I think the honest answer is it's very different for different people. And I think it's about the therapist bringing, you know, we bring the, the knowledge of the underpinning um, principles of what we're doing. And I think it's about having really honest conversations with the individual about um, these are the potential benefits, these are potential downsides, you know, what do you think? And it's about, I guess, that joint decision making about what is right for somebody. So, which kind of doesn't answer your question in a really like yes no way unfortunately you're Thanks on so sorry yes i i think lucy is, is very happy with <laughs> your reply she gave you a thumbs up and maybe we have our next question from liz she asks how do you or would you assess airway clearance adherence in clinic? Do you think there are things we physios could do to improve our assessment of airway clearance adherence in routine clinic reviews? That's a really good question. And actually, I'd probably, um, you know, invite any physios on the on the call, even any, um, you know, any any patients uh, you know, to have a bit of a, a discussion about this. I think. There is technology out there that can, um, we, so we, it is possible to chip certain nebulizers and that can, and, and things like the INEB has an ability to, to download and see how often somebody is, is taking their medicines. Um, but I think they have their limitations as well. So just because somebody has done their 7% saline doesn't mean that they've done all of the components of that re regime and it doesn't tell you how necessarily how well a certain some of them do some of the, you know the INEBs can tell you how long the, the the dose has taken to run through and things but I think it is tricky I know that there's a team in um a team in London who are looking at chipping nebulizers um and sorry not nebulizers airway clearance devices um, and looking at being able to link these to um, well, A for data collection, but also for um, like engagement. So they can link up to video games, um, which can help. But again, I'm not sure that I, I don't know um, whether how well they are looking at you know, different parts of the regime. And obviously that only works if you're using a device. So if you're doing active cycle of breathing technique or aesthetic drainage and you're just breathing, then a, you can't chip, <laughs> you can't chip your lungs. So how, you know, how do we measure that? And you know, there's all sorts of things like diaries and things, but they they're really they're quite flawed in terms of being able to really accurately measure how how people are doing. 
you know, people can use apps and things. So I think there are things out there, but I think they all have their limitations. So an app only works actually if you remember to put the data in and if you put the data in honestly. And again, it's it's about that. Is it just about do you do your physio twice a day or is it that quality component? And the quality component is much more difficult to collect the data on. So I don't know if anybody else has got um, any sort of ideas on, on how this could be done better or if anybody has experience of things that they use to collect adherence information. So, so I'm a patient and I have an Excel spreadsheet that has the different components of the airway clearance, the nebulizer, the aerobica, et cetera, exercise. And I, for any given day, I write what I did or didn't do versus how I felt. I have tons of data. I have found no correlations or use out of it. I have to admit. Did you find it? Um, I don't know. Did you find it? beneficial collecting it or did you, you know, did, how did it find sort of feel to you collecting that information? Collecting the information makes the clinic visits with the pulmonologist much easier because when I'm asked how did I feel, how much sputum, what colors, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, I just look at the Excel matrix. In terms of the uh, ACT adherence, unfortunately, I don't have a clinic that follows it at all. I don't get to see a physio. That's really interesting. Um, thank you, Lynn. And I think that was, um, I think I agree with you that um, it's really hard to know how to monitor adherence. And I suppose, um, going back to what the, the lady was just saying about um, monitoring her own adherence, one of the things I think I wonder is if there is a better way of asking it in clinic and I think I'm always very aware as a physio that I don't want to come across as judgmental um, because I certainly know when I had a bad shoulder and I was given physio exercises, I was absolutely hopeless at doing them. And it, it made me realise that um, that it's, it's harder than you think um, adhering to something that apparently just feels so simple to do and so easy to fit into your lifestyle. Absolutely. I think certainly, um, you know, I agree. I think it's about having having conversations in a way that feels like it's OK to be honest and it's OK. Like nobody's well, very, very few people manage everything all of the time, because like you say, you know, physiotherapy is one element of what's going on in somebody's world. Mm -hmm. And I think as physios, it's, you know, the the relationship uh, works best with our patients when we when certainly when we see more of that world and help us to put what we're asking them to do into that context like you you know like you've described it's it's so it's so tricky isn't it um you know there's there's so many things there's so many threats to doing your physiotherapy regime in a day be it you know things that are unpredictable and the fact that it's really not the most exciting thing to do and you know you can't multitask very easily because you have to concentrate and your nebulizer is really noisy it's it is it's really tricky and I think as lifestyles you know the world is only getting busier isn't it and lifestyles are getting busier and there's more time pressures on us and it's it's really challenging then trying to to manage your little bit of space and your airway clearance within all of that We have a few comments in the in the chat. Uh, thanks, wonderful talk. Uh, congratulations, great talk, really useful for all of us. Um, I believe Yin Ting has a question. Yes. Um, then you showed us very clearly um, some method that was excellent also with, um, first of all, some um, um, you, you showed some um, images of posture and manual techniques um, and also for um, autogenic um, drainage and also including percussion. I wonder if um, regarding quality of life and how many times um, all, all these exercises um, take per day, do you, is, is this something that you recommend um, maybe people would like to reduce all those um, times that they um, spend on physio, maybe to combine some um, percussion um, techni techniques with nebulization or something to, to do at the same time, just, just to reduce um, the time spent daily on, on, on the treatment? 
Yeah, so I think I think treatment times um, and frequency are very um, individual, um, and I think um, yeah, it, it varies between different individuals how long people need, but also how long people feel that they can give to physiotherapy, um, and certainly when people are more unwell, um, it may be that those those needs increase as well. Um, I think there's definitely some elements that can be combined, and certainly you know when you are using your adjunct for instance when you're using your acapella or your pet mask you can be doing that with components of your breathing technique you know because absolutely you are breathing <laughs> whilst you're using your pet mask so it's about you know trying to breathe well while they, they they're done and and certainly we can look to combine bits I think it's a very individual thing so you know I, you know, quite commonly will combine, um, you know, for instance, pet masks with some percussion for, for people that are just starting to get used to pet masks, some of our younger children, but actually for some of them, it's such a distraction and they can't, they can't manage to combine them because, you know, if, as soon as somebody starts patting, they, they forget what they're supposed to be doing with the pet mask. So I think it's a really individual thing. So I think there's, there's definite benefits to combining things sometimes in terms of time and efficiency and treatment burden. I think there's some times when it doesn't work as well. And I think there's, there's, sometimes when it doesn't work for certain individuals so yeah it's still that kind of personalization and, and really getting to taking the time to get to know um what the specific challenges are for the person that you're working with what's most important for that person at that point in time and then how you work towards just making the regime as 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 you know as good as it can be at that time point great thanks a lot and yes absolutely makes sense yeah it needs to be feasible for, for each um, individual, absolutely. So we have another question from DCP España. Do you think that differences between PCD variants can influence the kind of physio we should do? I think we'll learn more about that. Um, I think one of the most interesting examples of this is um, is something like so the oscillatory pep um and yeah be interested again to know what the other physios on the call think um so the one of the theories behind oscillatory pep is that they are designed to um oscillate at the same frequency as your cilia moves so things like the acapella and um the aerobica and the, the flutter the idea is that they, they they beat at a similar frequency to your cilia and that you know it all kind of assists together to move the secretions up and out but if you're if you if you silly don't move you know does that still have the same effect you know because we know that some people with pcd their cilia moves at a normal beat a frequency and some people it, it moves too fast some people it doesn't move at all and i don't think we know the answers to these questions yet um and i know i've definitely had some people who find that os you know the oscillatory pet devices work well for them and some people who actually they got much better with the the stable pep and i don't know if I don't think we know as yet whether that's because of the cilia and the type of PCD that somebody has or whether it's just uh, something else. Um, so I think there's lots of unanswered questions and it will be interesting as we start to get more information about PCD variants and genetics to see if there are um, certain types of interventions that seem to work better for other people. But, you know, within all of this, we need to understand how we know if something is working, what outcome measure we use, how do we tell if something is working. So I think we've still got lots of pieces of the jigsaw puzzle that we need to put together. And, you know, I think it's great having this opportunity to explore some of these questions, because hopefully, you know, when we have a room of lots of, you know, people who come at this from different angles, hopefully we can start to get the answers to some of these questions, because ultimately if somebody's going to spend time doing their physio, we want it to work as best as possible for them. Absolutely. Thanks a lot, Lynn. We have a comment from SM. She says, the more and well, the harder I find it to do the airway clearance. It's, it's exhausting. Yes, absolutely. It's very, very and it's, it's really um, energy consuming doing physio. You know, it, it is. And I, I have a very small experience from when I've had chest infections and it just, you know, the, the cough, the frequency that you need to cough, I think just is exhausting. And those, you know, in the same way as if you went out and did a run every day, multiple times a day, your legs would feel tired. Naturally, your breathing and your coughing muscles get 
tired and exhausted with that as well and so I think sometimes if you are unwell it's trying to break it down into small chunks and give yourself rest to try and make it as achievable as possible and, and trying to take the easy wins so if there are slightly um easier ways of airway clearance that you you know you take those um on that day and, and you just make things as, as manageable as possible to get you through it yes absolutely and this is Espana and Tamuna, I guess it's Trini and Tamuna, they say thank you, and it's very interesting. And I hand over to Katie's question. Um, I understand that you're a, a paediatric um, physiotherapist, but what's the transition like between um, physiotherapy as a, as a child and then going into adulthood? Are they handed over to a different team or is there some kind of um, transition program in the UK? Yeah, so in the UK, um, we are lucky in that we have um, designated PCD physiotherapists in adults as well. Um, so Liz, um, who's on the call, is one of our adult PCD physiotherapists. Um, and I think we work really closely to, um, you know, to hand over um, all of the information about the patient as they move into adult services. Um, I think a key part of that is the preparation and the run up to it, because actually throughout that process, you know, the, the young person is you know, becoming more of an adult and becoming more independent within that as well. So certainly from um, even from sort of being really quite young, you know, trying to sort of engage young people with feeling confident to talk in clinic and ask, uh, ask questions, because even from, um, you know, really quite young, they can sometimes answer the easy questions. So what colour is your phlegm? Um, you know, can you tell me what you do for your airway clearance? to start building them them kind of up and ready for as they become adults and, and starting to teach them about why they're having to do airway clearance, you know, what are the reasons, you know, why, you know, why might it be beneficial to do it? Because I think it certainly is very difficult when you're a teenager and you just want to be the same as all of your friends and, you know, you, being an adult feels like ages away and you want to take risks and you know you don't care and you don't want to speak to anybody thanks very much and it can be really tricky so I think a lot of it is about um really working with that individual as they're moving towards adulthood to make them feel empowered and feel able to take on some of that responsibility from their parents so that as they move up into the adult services that yes absolutely the adult team know what's happening but also they know what's happening so they're not, not moving up as a as a as a child with a parent that suddenly then is is left actually they are progressing towards adults you know throughout that journey so there is a change of team um and you know possibly it's it's you know a, a fresh pair of eyes and there may be some changes when people move into adult services um and that's great but it's that gem you know it's that trajectory of change over time um yeah and liz i don't know if you see things differently from from your end with uh, being on the receiving end of uh, of our adolescents as they arrive with you um, no, I think I would agree that um, certainly the first time that I saw somebody who transitioned from a paediatric service to the adult service, unless there was something really, really glaringly obvious or um, their, their chest was very different, they had an exacerbation or something, I don't think I'd be jumping in to change airway clearance techniques straight away because I think partly I've got to get to know them as a person and what works for them um, and they have to get to know me and we have to build a relationship that's based on mutual respect um, but I think also it would be about um, respecting what the paediatric physio has done with them and that they obviously know that person a lot better than I do and have chosen that particular area clearance technique for um, a particular reason so yeah and I, I'd rarely jump in and chase something straight away um, I think often we do change things as things go on but I think that's partly because that person um, grows up and um, life changes and they have kids or they have a job or they go off to university and so maybe what worked for them when they were going to school and everything was quite routine doesn't work for them as, as their life alters um, but also their their lungs may change and speaking may become thicker or stickier um, but yeah thank you both very much for your input 
Um, we have a question from Bishara. She asks, um, as an outcome measure, do you prefer using the six minute walk test or the modified shuttle test with PCD and why? And she also says, thank you very much. Very interesting. Um, so we, I guess we, we face challenges with using um, different outcome measures with PCD. And I think that's primarily because we go out and do clinics all over the place. So it's quite difficult trying to um, turn up and do any of these exercise tests when you are going out to lots of different clinics or um, in different places. I think in terms of looking at them as outcome measures, I think it depends on what age group um, and, and what kind of group of patients you are working with. So the six minute walk test basically looks at how fast you can walk in, in six minutes um, along sort of a predefined, I think it's a 10 meter track. Um, and the modified shuttle test is where um, some people may have done it at school where there's um, like a, a recording of, of timed beeps and you've got to kind of get to the end of the, of the, of the track. But when the beep arrives and the beeps get faster, so you have to move between the tracks. Um, so the modified shuttle test tends to be able to challenge you more. So um, most people won't get to the, you know, they won't be able to get like, all the way through and get faster and faster and faster. At some point they will stop either because of their breathing or because of the legs or because they just can't get so way to be quick enough. Um, so it, it tends to be quite good at, at capturing, at capturing people's um, variability. Sometimes with a six minute walk test, if you've got people that are more able um, actually you know you have lots of people that can do really quite well on six minute walk test and it might not show you what's going on for their PCD it might just show you actually physically how you know how fast they can get around the cone so it might not it sometimes it doesn't you get what is known as like a ceiling effect in that actually it's it's quite difficult you know if you are very good um you know then you suddenly started on a new treatment intervention if you're already very good it's quite hard to tell the difference of that intervention because you're already very good whereas the the modified shuttle walk test has more scope for you to improve um on a little bit so i think it's it, it's different depending on what you are looking at um there is also an incremental step test, um, which basically is, is the same kind of beats getting faster, but stepping up and down off a step, which can be quite useful if you don't have the space um, to do the kind of the, the, the walk test. So I think they all have their individual roles and it depends on what purpose you're using it for. Thanks, Lynn. I remember the dreaded bleep test at school. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think Yin Ting has another question. Yes, um, about physical activity or exercise recommendations. Is there any particular exercise that you would recommend to produce this half and puff work what you described? So we tend to go with sort of the government guidelines of the, of what kind of any any child or adult should be doing that's sort of age appropriate. So when you're very little, it's more um, uh, little and often exercise up to sort of a total of three hours a day. And then as you get you know up to being an adult, it's more looking at you sort of like five times 30 minutes as a, as, a, as a minimum. And that's sort of aerobic exercise. So um, exercise where you are breathing deeper and faster um, that really helps to kind of open up your, your airways. Um, I think the most important thing with any kind of exercise is that it's something that's enjoyable because if you don't enjoy it, you won't do it. Um, so I know for me, if, uh, you know, I don't know if someone said to me, you have to go swimming, I, I, I wouldn't go because, you know, I'm not, I'm not great at swimming, but actually I quite like running. So it's more about what you what you like to do. Um, I think it's, um, you know, there's a school of thought about, you know, trying to, you know, have a bit of a you know some kind of oscillatory component and moving your chest with it so you know things like running do give you I guess a little bit of a vibration um you know and, and certainly if you're thinking about things like cross trainers they will give your chest a little bit of a move so I don't think there's one type of exercise that's really been proven as more beneficial so I guess as I say the key for me is is what people enjoy but you know also if somebody tells me that when they do a certain kind of exercise their cough loads up brilliant you want to a winner I don't know, but, uh, Liz, have you got any sort of um, different sort of perspective from the world of adults? Sorry, I'm just unmuting myself. Um, no, not particularly. I think um, you'd always want to do a bit of cardio, really, to um, get those increased um, bigger breaths so that you're sort of helping get that sputum moving. Um, and I suppose one of the things that I 
do you say when people say that they're doing exercises how out of breath you're getting because you can go for a walk can't you um and it can be very nice and sedate and um you have a very nice time but you probably aren't doing anything for moving your secretions where you could you could march up a hill um in the lake district or something um and that would probably really move your secretion so i suppose it's just unpicking that a bit and working out exactly how intense that exercise it is and what you're doing with it And I guess Excellent. it's it's sometimes yeah. thinking about timing sort of um, medications around exercise as well, isn't it? So, you know, if you if you know that you you get a little bit wheezy to make sure that, you know, you're opening up your airways adequately and um, some people will take um, a nebulizer before they do their you know exercise to help them kind of clear it. Obviously, you need to make sure you've got some tissues and things that you might need to hand whilst you're out and about doing your exercise. Um, but yeah. Absolutely. And, and I guess keeping hydrated with exercise is the other thing, isn't it? Um, so dehydration really affects the thickness of sputum. Um, and when you exercise, you will, um, you know, use more fluids. So trying to make sure you keep well hydrated and replenish the fluids that you've used while you've been exercising. Excellent. Thank you both very much. And I think Tamuna's questions what question was similar to mine which sports would be better for people with pcd i think you both just answered this if not tamina please um yeah maybe i'll write your follow-up question if it was not answered um no more questions in the chat box maybe just one final question from my side um now if you could design your own study or your or focus on your own um study um interest then what would you like to um improve or seek any kind of improvement or gaining more knowledge in um, regards of physiotherapy in pcd any new improvements of the devices or any guideline developments what would you like to have or what would, what would you like to see the future in physiotherapy in PCD heading towards to? Gosh, that's a <laughs> that's a, a big question because I think as as I think we're really consciously aware within physiotherapy that um, there is very little PCD research. Um, so I think um, I think there are an awful lot of unanswered questions um, and. Um, you know, and certainly, as I described, we can look to CF and, and bronchiectasis literature, but actually, I think it's really important that we have PCD specific research. Um, obviously, this is a rare disease. And I think um, the benefits of trying to collaborate on things is always really beneficial in terms of um, being able to, you know, you know, gather larger data sets to be able to look at, you know, really true meaningfulness of, of, of you know, of the findings. Um, and I think a key step towards that, um, which I don't have the answers to, is, is how we, you know, how we really easily collect, um, as I say, this very information on this very varied, um, very untick box um, intervention you know it is a really physiotherapy is such a complex intervention um there's there's so many com components and, and variability in it and i think to allow us to um collaborate on research we need to start finding ways to to be able to work out how we quantify some of this information um but yeah i, I don't know how i, I know i, I can generally see Liz, Liz the, so Liz and if there's any other physios on the call it'd be great to hear from you on this one as well. Thank you very much. I know it's a difficult question but as you as you already said there's lots lots and lots to to study and to do research on, on physio and but it, it's what, what you pointed out is, is just excellent. Thank you very much. And Kate, I think we have one more question from Tamuna. Um, another question, when to know if a person overloads his or herself with exercise? Many people say they feel worse when exercising too hard. Sometimes they even have exacerbations. Um, interesting. Um, again, I think this is very individual and it's unpicking uh, what this is a little bit. So I think um, 
I would be interested to know what too hard means, um, you know, because, I, you know, there's there's all kinds of um, variables as to what this could be. Is it that it feels too hard for that individual? Is it somebody that is exercising, you know, a very high intensity for multiple hours in the day? Um, and I think, you know, looking at um, nutrition is important. So I think, um, you know, if you are exercising a lot, it's important to look at nutrition. I've not heard of people feeling that they develop exacerbations with exercise it might be that you know if you think about the you know that vicious cycle of um of inflammatory change and things you know it might be that something was already brewing actually that you already had a bacterial infection and it's just the timing of sort of picking up the exercise that has you know kind of tipped you into sort of uh, feeling unwell um i don't know i yeah, I think that's quite a tricky one to answer without knowing the specifics for that individual. So what I would maybe suggest is um, try and, you know, speak to a physiotherapist about it, try and um, collect information about exactly what's happening, what your timeline of events are, um, what, you know, what is, yeah, what's happening for you when you are exercising and what you're doing so that you can try and work out what might be causing you to feel more unwell, because certainly that's, that's not what we would expect or what we would want from exercise. Uh, too hard meaning breathing too fast during exercise so um so you can i guess it, there there are there are different thresholds when you're exercising so um there is kind of an optimal range that you can exercise from uh, from a cardiovascular fitness point of view um so it might be interesting to again maybe speak to your physiotherapist as an individual and maybe they can do you know do some exercise like an exercise session with you or an exercise test to see um what you were experiencing when you are exercising to try and understand where you're breathing too fast or too hard it might be um secretion clearance it might be a fitness thing it might be that you're using slightly different muscles to breathe and actually that by um, looking at the your what we call your breathing pattern the way that you're breathing that actually we can help you to breathe more efficiently when you're exercising and then yeah you should be able to cope with things a little bit better so yeah there's probably quite a lot of variables and, and would need to be looked at on an individual basis thank you well as there are no more questions in the chat we'll we'll wrap it up there thanks again lynn for your amazing talk it was super informative um, and thanks again for this really vivid discussion.